so I'm part of a of the team, and the team deserves all the credit. Um, I'm just a product manager who uh, drives some of our uh, capabilities at Visa around what we do with um, our tooling around cataloging, governance, quality. Um, and Mika, if you go to the next slide. Um, very briefly about Visa, I don't think I need to go into too much detail about what, what Visa is or does. Um, I'll, I'll just actually start with, we're not a bank, so just so everybody knows, we don't actually issue your card. Um, we actually are the network underneath all of that. And so what we call moving money globally, we connect um, effectively everybody's wallet, whether it's a physical or a digital one on a phone or whatever device. Uh, with like a whole lot of merchants in a whole lot of countries. Um, and so we're, we're typically like the invisible glue uh, or the invisible network underneath the money that moves around. Uh, and we try to make that as seamless as possible. Um, a lot of the things we do are around seamlessness, security, and trust. Um, and, and you'll hear me say the word governance, and that is really related to us understanding data and making sure we use data in both an ethical and in an appropriate manner. So it's a really big deal for Visa as a company to understand what we do with data um, and to get all the proper consent and all of that. So that's a little bit about Visa. You can see the numbers here. Some of them are pretty impressive. Um, I don't think that the transaction number is necessarily impressive to people who do large scale, scale systems. Just keep in mind that these systems do move money, right? So all of these messages are really important to actually arrive at the end destination. So that's that's really our goal. Um, as part of that, we as a team, um, what we'll called a data and AI platform. Uh, Miko, if you shift to the next slide, um, we actually take all of those wonderful transactions that go over this network, and we put them into what we call our data and AI platform. And so just to give you a bit idea of, of what our systems look like. First and foremost, most of it is in our own data centers. Um, most of the backbone that, that runs that transaction is, is in our data centers. And so we connect our analytics and AI platforms directly into that. And they are typically somewhat co-located or very closely co-located. Um, our typical, oops, our typical, um, setup is that we use Kafka for most of our messaging systems in terms of the analytics side of the house. Um, Spark is our large kind of scale data programming language. We have a bunch of Hadoop clusters, a bunch of database systems, right? There's nothing spectacular in that other than that these things are honky dory big. Um, common BI stuff and we invest a ton on AI. Um, we've been doing that for many years, even before AI and Gen AI was like the coolest thing ever. Um, and you'll notice a lot of it um, actually directly in, in your payments, like the whole monitoring around fraudulent activity is all AI driven. And, and like I said, we've been doing that for quite some time. So we invest a ton of that and we invest a ton in the data that powers those things, right? Our, our AI systems are only as good as our data that powers it and increasingly uh, I think everybody's starting to realize that data without metadata is, is a bit painful and a bit hard. And so um, there's more and more focus, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about our journey, but there's more and more focus on, on the cataloging of that data. Um, I'll, I'll try to predict something here, um, looking at all the laws and all of the uh, uh, AI hype that's going on and the usage of it. Um, I think everybody should start to invest more and more in cataloging and metadata because you are going to ask get asked a lot of questions as to what is this data come from, what is it used for, which model uses it. Um, and so start thinking beyond traditional data flows, start thinking about cataloging and, and connecting this deeply into your AI systems. We actually do a ton of, of um, open source and in-house build. And I'll switch that over to our data catalog journey, right? Because we actually started about five years ago and we looked around the market and we didn't see anything really interesting. So we actually built our own catalog system um, and we've been doing that for a while. And obviously if you build something, you get to focus on exactly what, what, what we wanted in that system. And so we really looked at, at trying to get the organization to go to metadata first. Also in, in anticipation of, of understanding where our data is used. 
And so we've been on a build journey for a few years. And we started to realize that while you get a lot of control over it, there's also a lot of things that you have to keep on doing. Um, it's like having a family dog, right? The dog never grows up. You have to keep on feeding it. You have to take it to the vet. You have to pay attention to it. It doesn't just kind of grow up, right? And so many of these systems, you'll spend a lot of time working on things that are not driving value for the, for the business, right? My, my Visa business users don't get excited about us maintaining a Kafka cluster or building a messaging system uh, under our catalog. And so we are moving to Data Hub. We've deployed into production uh, now. And we really see good coverage on what we need in Data Hub. I'll talk about our wish list in a little bit. And so we are now shoveling everything into Data Hub. We're, we're going live probably over the next couple of weeks with all of our production systems ingested into Data Hub. It'll be the mainstay of our catalog. Um, we're very excited about kind of some of the basic pieces, right? Having the messaging, the alerting, which all sound like basic and well, why can't you build that? Because it's just a lot of work, right? And and we don't really want to do it. The other thing we're super excited about and, and what we really like about Data Hub is the API backbone underneath it. Um, I'll talk a bit about embedding later, but for us, that's a key capability. We have a lot of users that never interact with the UI of our catalog. Right. We have a ton of, of data engineers and users that interact through APIs into various other tool integrations. Um, I, I love the one tool to rule them all, by the way. Um, we, we never got into that, but I think the, the, the message there rings really true. I think overall, you want to make sure that the catalog powers all of these things and that everything powers the catalog. And so this whole kind of combined ecosystem is a really important thing where we're going as well. So we connect a lot of our ETL solutions. We connect a lot of our subscription tools into the catalog. Um, like I said, our current status, we, we've deployed into production. We're actually waiting for our PR to, to be all fully baked and, and going in. Um, we will probably deploy that as a fork internally first. Um, and, and just to talk about that, Mick, if you can go to the next slide. So here's what, what we are, and this is kind of our first real contribution. Um, this is what we are trying to do. And, and you can see the links at the bottom of the slide. But one of the things we have is we have a pretty sprawling ecosystem, right? We have a, a, a number of Hadoop clusters. Um, we deal with data localization. So we will see duplication or, or triplication of our, our data systems to some extent. And so one of the things that we've consistently struggled with <clears throat> is how do I consistently manage classifications, <clears throat> definitions, um, policies associated with data across all of that. Now, everybody says like, well, that's easy. Your data engineer can just do it, but we want to avoid making our data engineers the owner of all sorts of business definitions, classifications, policies. And so we're really looking about it at an abstraction, a more of a logical model where we can do this once and then we connect that into our data sets. And then we move the maintenance of what we call a business attribute uh, largely to our data stewards and, and data subject matter experts. And so this is what we're doing. We're building this thing called a business attribute. And it aggregates or collects a whole bunch of business information. Like business terms and definitions is one of them. We have a, a pretty extensive classification system. Uh, right, And the simplest one to always call out is, is something PI information? or is something not PI information? What PI is it? All sorts of things like that. Um, we're also anticipating that we're gonna need a lot more of this, right? And that's why the title uses the word scale, because we need to figure out how across thousands, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of data sets and millions of columns, how to get all of this connected and appropriately propagated through to the catalog to consumers. And so Business Attributes collects all of that. Um, we then map it into a table column. And so now we've established a relationship between this logical construct and all of these columns and tables. And so this is the first step for us 
um, to implement some of the things we have running in our production systems in-house now in Data Hub. Let me go to the next slide. So that's what it looks like. Um, this is just standard Data Hub uh, open source UI. Uh, on the top left, you have a, a new attribute, a new uh, menu item called the business attribute. Um, you click on that. You get your typical create screen. I didn't show you all of that, right? But I'm just going to use one of them here, which is an example out of out of um, what you would typically see in our systems. So cashback amount, everybody knows roughly what that is. We we add a description there. The important thing is we actually add the glossary terms into that. Um, I haven't added any links in here because they're going to go to some custom and proprietary visa stuff. So I don't want to show any of that. But we basically build up this business attribute, including the ownership um, and the glossary terms that are associated with that. And that establishes this whole construct of what does this actually mean? And that in the bottom bit, we've done attached to a field. Right? And you'll see some weird white spaces that simply to, to block out all sorts of interesting visa stuff. Um, and there's the interesting thing that happens is the moment you go into that business attribute column at the bottom there and you pick this business attribute called cashback amount, it populates the grayed out description text, it populates the associated glossary terms, it creates all of that in here. And so now if you're an end user or a consumer and you're looking at the catalog going, well, what does this all mean? You get all of that information directly provided uh, in a curated manner and, and it's connected into the business attribute. So if I change the description, or I add things or I do things, um, they reflect as well. We still anticipate, and that's what we do on a do on a routine basis, that people augment even that column again, right? Because there is generic information, right? This is a cashback amount, its PI is no. But in our case, this field actually is in the acquire currency. And so at the bottom there, you see that there's an additional uh, glossary term added to that, which explains more context to this attribute. So that's our, kind of our first step to get to a logical model and, and build this out. Let me give you the next slide. And it's it's kind of part of our wish list. Um, like the first one, which is there, like structured properties is important to us because we extend our, most of our, our elements we extend and we want some, um, we want a way of, of adding additional property, so that's good. Um, we're contributing business attributes, so that's in progress, so that's good. Um, one of the things you saw me do is use glossary terms quite a bit. And what we're trying to get to, and we're going to probably submit something around glossary types, like I've called it here in quotes. Um, we're trying to figure out how do I distinguish a business term from a classification from a policy right and they're all they all smell very similar they all have a bunch of text and they all have a link and they all have a bunch of these things but we do want to notify or, or show in the ui that these things are slightly different so that's one of our things that that we are kind of looking into but the big one which is on the screen here um, is logical data sets um, and it's it's a little bit related to I think how our system set up, but it's going to think benefit benefit like a lot if you want to scale out governance. Um, for us, most of our main tables we have at least six copies, and those are the ones that that I know of top of head, right? And there is there is probably twelve more somewhere. Um, and to scale governance, rather than going to each physical table in each physical environment and figuring out how to put a lasso around and rope them together. Uh, a construct like a logical data set will, will make our life a ton easier because we can connect that logical data set and connect it to these physical ones. And now all of my business users and my data stewards don't actually have to figure out, oh, Hadoop cluster number seven or oh, the DB2 database number three. Uh, you don't have to trawl around all of this stuff. And we're really trying to figure out how to kind of elevate where we put our data products, where we put our data contracts, where we do put our definitions. And that's where we think logical data sets is going to give us an, um, a, a much better scale out model for that. And then we connect that into our all of our data sets and then we can drive the governance piece of the logical um, data sets. The other use case that I'm sure everybody has is the one as to where is my data, 
and what does this data mean in business context and where does it live in physical context right and you can do that with data products but for us having the potential of a logical data set connecting a data product to that data contracts to that and then we can push that through our our stack is, is probably a much more scalable manner and then we'll have one more slide so miko next slide and so i'll i'll, I'll share um some of the things we've learned in our, our five-year metadata journey that's since I joined Visa. Um, and I'm going to kind of start in the middle here. Uh, the invisible catalog. Um, it's a very powerful tool for anybody who wants to start a catalog initiative as going with one. You'll probably need to fund it. Um, you'll have to make it into a visible catalog. So you have to have a good message around it and, and what it powers. The invisible catalog is, is coming back to the one tool to rule them all. Um, it's very hard to dictate everybody to use one tool and whatnot. And so for us, the API strategy is really important. And I would recommend everybody to look at this. People use various tools, like we saw DBT and nice tight integration with that. We use various other tools like ETL tools. We have built custom in-house software for subscriptions. Right. For us, we bury the catalog into all of those things. We have, like I said, yes, we have users who do search and browse and, and whatnot, but a ton of our catalog use is actually embedded in other tools. My recommendation, don't fight it, right? Go and can partner, go and share, go and, and tell everybody here's the API, connect this thing into everything, right? And have everybody connect into right from all of those things. Um, the other thing we tried really hard is to do a metadata first approach. And that's all about schema evolution, not breaking upstream things. Um, how do I maintain schema versions, all of that stuff? It's very hard to enforce. Um, we stood on the soapbox, we stood on the stage, we, we said everything, all the right words, right? And people were like, yes, sounds great to me, but <laughs> I'm doing something different, man. Um, and so we've switched, and that's why we like Data Hub as well. We switched to a closed loop system. We simply become agnostic. We say, if you want to do metadata first, here's how you do it. If you want to deploy stuff, we ingest it. And so we continuously keep telling people, here's a change, here's a thing, look at this. And so rather than enforcing how people do things, we enforce the action. Right? If you're the owner of a data set, you are expected and measured against the actions you take. You made a change, you need to decorate your metadata to make it compliant, et cetera. So we focus a lot more on that, and that's a much better strategy to getting your catalog refreshed, up to date, embedded, all of those things. And then last one, we have a significant um, software organization, like both on data engineering side as well as software engineering. Um, we did build our own catalog. Um, it is a serious investment. You have full control, but you have a serious investment to take uh, and to, to work with. So my recommendation is that you probably want to look at open source because it gives you a bit of a, a bit of the best of both worlds, right? You can influence, you can talk to the community, you can bring in ideas, you can move this thing. Um, if you're like us, and not everybody is like us, you can actually start to contribute and you can start to, to really engage and, and hopefully kind of find common ground and, and drive some of the open source capabilities uh, to solve common problems for everybody. So it gives you the best of both worlds. Now, if you want to buy software, um, putting it on top of an open source backbone is probably a great idea. So again, you get kind of the hey, I have vendor support, but you also have a solid community behind it. And, and you know it doesn't go into left field because of something, right? So you get this kind of safety in numbers. You get your support. Um, and again, not everybody's like Visa, where we have enough people and power and, and money to actually go invest in our own software, right? So um, those are some of my lessons learned. Um, that's all I had, Miko. Right? Next is Q&A and whatever you guys want to do.